Good morning, and welcome to our worship at the First Christian Church Disciples of Christ in Selma. We are glad you are with us today on this 17th Sunday after Pentecost. All are welcome in this sacred space, and all means all. A few announcements. Next week is World Communion Sunday. After our 1030 worship service, there will be a special outdoor communion service on the lawn at 1230 p.m. Please bring your lawn chairs and wear your masks as we celebrate the Lord's Supper together with Christians around the world. Also, next week begins our annual stewardship campaign, Walking Into It. It will be a special month of praying and discerning God's vision for the disciples of Christ in Selma and beyond. May we walk boldly and confidently into the bright future God has for us. My brothers and sisters, let us be prepared in hearts and minds to worship our God. and earth proclaim the majesty of God's creative power. Praise God for the amazing and awesome beauty. God has given to us codes by which we live together in harmony and peace in these commandments. God has summed up the ways we must respect one another. Let us rejoice in the goodness of God and let us praise God for his complete and steadfast love for us.
As we come together in worship, may God bless this community. As we lift our hearts and prayers, may we listen to God's voice and trust in his word. And may we be encouraged and comforted by his Holy Spirit. Awesome God, with just a word and a breath, you made everything. You created a universe so big we can't imagine it, and particles so small we cannot see them. You arranged creation in such a way that everything depends on every other thing in order for it all to work together as planned. And you gave it into our hands to care for as stewards of your earth. Your power is so great, we don't have words to fully describe it. And yet, you care for us. You love us. In gratitude, we come together to worship you, to sing your praises, to hear your word, to share a meal of remembrance, and to pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we confess that we don't always act as you would have us act. We don't always speak as you would have us speak. We don't always love as you would have us love. We don't always try our best to avoid sin. We don't always try our best to seek your will. For all these things, we ask your forgiveness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. There is so much to pray about, Lord. Our nation is divided. We are suffering a pandemic and multiple extreme natural disasters, while also experiencing social upheaval over racism and gender and politics. Too many people have lost their jobs their health insurance, their homes, their loved ones. Too many people have nowhere to go and not enough to eat, and the people who usually help cannot. Help us to come together as one people, to care for one another as you would have us do. Until these troubles are behind us and our nation is healed, Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. We ask your special blessings on all those people who are ill and infirm, bedridden and homebound, being treated for an illness or waiting for a diagnosis, injured and recovering, or enduring chronic pain, living with mental illness or addiction. And for the caregivers and the first responders and all essential workers and the volunteers who do everything they can to help the helpless and bring hope to the hopeless, we offer names into the silence.
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious and forgiving God, your Son Jesus taught us that you forgive the repentant, welcome the lost, embrace the unlovable, that your greatest desire is for the whole world to be reconciled to you and healed of strife and sin. Because of that, we make bold to ask all of these things, depending on your mercy and compassion, praying as he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. A reading from the Gospel according to St. Matthew. When he entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, then I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven, or was it of human origin? And they argued with one another. If we say from heaven, he will say to us, Why then did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the crowd, for all regard John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus, We do not know. And he said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. He answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and went. The father went to the second and said the same. And he answered, I go, sir but he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, the first. Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness and you did not believe him, but the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw it, you did not change your mind and believe him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning, or afternoon, or maybe evening, depending on when you are joining us for worship. Whenever it is, wherever you are right now, it is a perfect time for worship. When I select the scripture reading for each Sunday, I determine a focus for the message. Maybe a particular verse captures my attention or a proverb or truism pops into my mind when I read it. The reading and the focus help me select a hymn that reiterates my point and helps Jordan select all the other music for that Sunday. This way, when the time comes to preach on any particular passage, I have a good idea of where I wanna go. More often than not, I will have come back to it a few times and jotted down a story or a point I wanted to make I did all that with this one, but somehow my usual plan went sideways. Apparently I was jotting down ideas based on the title instead of the focus. And I have no idea what I was thinking when I chose the hymn. Luckily Jordan chose lots of good ones and the quarantine crew's singing always makes everything okay. <laughs> the title is saying yes and saying no. And with a presidential debate coming up this week, it was hard to get the idea of debating out of my mind. I mean, yes, Jesus was engaged in a running debate with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. At every encounter, he confounded them with his knowledge and his eloquence. But that thing about debates is that they rarely change the mind of anyone whose mind is already made up. They might sway a person who's kind of undecided 
But the true believers already know what they know. And no amount of logic or eloquence is going to change that. A story that my mother used to love to embarrass me with is about the day that she walked into the room where my sister and I were supposed to be taking a nap, only to find us standing up in our cribs, one yelling, yes, and the other yelling, no. No idea what that was about. But I suspect I was the no, because I tend to say no quickly, sort of like the character Jim on The Vicar of Dibley, who begins every sentence with no, 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 no. Jesus was teaching in the temple, so the chief priests and the elders wanted his credentials. He wasn't one from one of the old priestly families. He hadn't spent his life at the feet of a teacher in the temple learning the law and the prophets. So they asked, where do you get your authority to teach the way you do? Because it's really very different to what we are used to teaching, and we don't know you. Jesus took the opportunity to ask another of those who do you say that I am questions. Where do you all think John got his authority to baptize? Because everybody knew by that time that John had been talking about Jesus, so wherever John got the authority had to be where Jesus got his. They had to say, I don't know, because no matter what they said, they were going to get themselves in trouble. If they thought John, and by extension Jesus, was authorized by heaven, then they were clearly on the wrong side of this conversation. But the people thought John and Jesus came from God. So if the priests and elders said they didn't, the people would turn on them. Jesus knew why they answered that way, of course, and declined to let them off the hook or to answer their original question. Instead, he tells a story of two sons whose father wants them to go and work in the vineyard. One tells his father he will not go work in the vineyard, but does anyway. The other says he will, but doesn't. The priests and elders agreed it was the first who did God's will. Actions speak louder than words. Sometimes God calls us to do something that we really don't want to do. Maybe we're comfortable just the way we are. Or we have a zillion reasons why we can't do it. Maybe finances or lack of self-confidence. My experience has been that if God wants me to do something and I choose not to, there will be pain. I've learned it is better to just do whatever it is because none of my excuses will matter. If God called me to it, God will lead me through it. God will make a way somehow. Even if, like that first son, you don't want to do the thing and say you're not going to do the thing, but for whatever reason, you go ahead and do it anyway, even though you really don't want to, you are still doing God's will because actions speak louder than words. If, on the other hand, you say, yes, Lord, but don't make any effort beyond that. Well, Jesus said to his disciples, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. Even if that one says no before saying yes. The chief priests and the elders had positions of importance among the Jewish people. They were community leaders. They had important jobs. They upheld tradition. They had said yes to God, but they only did the things they had always done the way they had always done them. They believed they were doing right by God and the people. They were used to things being a certain way and being taught a certain way, and Jesus was turning their world upside down. They were teaching the way things had been taught forever, and Jesus shows up with the common core. They were not ready for this and they were not sure what to do about it. They found themselves on the defensive. And so when asked where John's authority derived, they had to say, I don't know. And Jesus said to them, you may not want to believe or to admit that you believe, but the tax collectors and the prostitutes 
believe. Even the people you won't allow in the temple to worship. People who are not good enough for you to sit down and eat with. Those people whom you despise are being saved before you because they are saying yes where you are saying no. They aren't letting preconceptions or antiquated traditions get in the way of hearing God's call to change their hearts and lives. They are not as afraid of change as you because the traditional ways of doing things are not doing them any good. Doing things the way we have always done them only helps the people in positions of power and they will do anything to keep from losing that power. The chief priests and elders didn't know Jesus because he wasn't one of them. He was not one of the people in power. Jesus came as an ordinary man, not a royal prince, not a member of the priestly families. He walked among the poor, worked among them. He was one of them. He knew life as they did because this was his lived experience. He knew society from the bottom. He knew what it was to be the object of prejudice, to hear people say, can anything good come out of Galilee? Jesus preached from a position of solidarity with the people who most needed him, against oppression, against focusing on the letter of the law rather than the spirit of the law, against people in positions of power who chose not to help the people who needed their help the most. Jesus spoke for the poor, the hungry, the helpless and the hopeless, the lost and the last. He spoke for justice with mercy, for compassion, for love. He told the story of a man who did not want to serve God when called, but went to work in the vineyard anyway. And the one who talked a good game but chose to do nothing. We are given the choice every day between saying yes and saying no. When you hear God's call, which will you say? Throughout scripture, God is constantly reminding his people what he had done for them. When they'd start complaining, he'd still remember what I did, I brought you out of Israel. So the Bible is full of stories of God reminding his people. We come today to the time of communion where we're being reminded what Jesus has done for us. So that night they were together, Jesus took the bread, blessed it, broke it, handed it to the disciples. This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then after supper, he took the cup, 
blessed it, passed it around. Drink this, all of you. This represents my blood, God's new covenant for the remission and forgiveness of sins. Let us eat and drink together. Shall we pray? God of history, we need to be reminded. Help us never forget what you have done for us through Jesus and that your love is infinite and without limits. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The parable of the two sons in Matthew can be frustrating. One commits to doing something and doesn't do it. The other doesn't commit to anything, but goes ahead and does it anyway. Is there a third option here? Where is the son who says he's going to do it and does it? We'd like to think that we're that third child, and yet we are often guilty of overcommitting and underperforming. There are so many demands placed upon us and it's hard to remember them all, much less fulfill them. As Paul says in Romans, we all fall short of the glory of God. That doesn't lessen the importance of the call God has placed on us. When we gave our life to Jesus Christ, we covenanted to be God's people in and for this world. That includes promising to share our blessings for the care of the least of these. We don't always do it perfectly, but we are called to do it faithfully. May this moment in worship be our opportunity to live out that promise. Let us pray. Living God, you have promised to be our God, and we have promised to be your people. Thank you for keeping your promise so faithfully. Help us to do the same as we offer these gifts to your service. Thank you for calling us to be your hands and feet in this world. In Jesus' name, amen. it is to follow through on promises. It can be easy to talk a big game or proclaim that we love the Lord. It's another thing to live out those words and do what we say. In this gospel lesson, Jesus assures us that he has authority to speak with the words of God himself. He also reminds us that we can rely on him to do what he promises. Jesus often disagreed with the leaders and teachers of his time. He often used parables to emphasize how to live and also to subtly explain who he was. In this passage, both of those things happen. The key to take away is that Christ fulfills his promises and expects us to live out our love as we serve one another and value his authority. May we truly be the church God calls us to be.
go bravely and boldly into this world of confusion and pain. Bring God's healing words of love and forgiveness. Know the power of mercy and grace in your life. Go in peace to use those wonderful gifts to serve God by serving the people. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.